Welcome, Professor Kamarul Zaman. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as you may know, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the United States National Cancer Act of 1971, which re-articulated a global mandate for the NCI that has existed really since the NCI was first established in 1937. This year also marks the 10th anniversary of the creation of a dedicated NCI Center for Global Health. We're using these simultaneous anniversaries as an opportunity to connect with key leaders, to speak with them about their views on the current state of global health uh, and global cancer research and control. So we're delighted that you were willing to speak with us, particularly given that this month we marked World AIDS Day. You are currently the president of the International AIDS Society, which is the largest association of HIV professionals in the world, with members spanning 170 countries. You were the first person from Asia to serve in this role and join a long line of extremely distinguished global health luminaries who've served in this capacity since IAS began. So welcome, thank you for being here and speaking with me today. Thank you very much, Dr. Gopal. It's my honor to um, join you this, this morning, this evening, your time, yeah. So to get started, um, since we did recently mark World AIDS Day, the second World AIDS Day to occur in the midst of the global COVID pandemic, I want to start just by asking you about that. What are your thoughts now in December, 2021 about where we are with respect to HIV globally. Yep, speaking of anniversaries, this is also the 40th year since HIV was um, first um, discovered, not, not the virus itself, but since the description of you know, young gay men in San Francisco um, developing unusual pneumonia. Um, you know, from, from that time, we have come a very long way. Um, there's been remarkable progress in treatment, in prevention uh, for HIV, so much so that, you know, we have this global goal to end AIDS by 2030. Of course, um, you know, let, let me just um, recap some of the advances um, in treatment, for instance, if, if you recall in the first decade or so, um, being diagnosed with HIV meant a death sentence. Uh, but now we have treatment where if someone is commenced on treatment at the time of diagnosis before, particularly before the immune system has been um, damaged by HIV, the person can essentially live a, a normal lifespan and, and certainly a normal healthy life. So, you know, I, I trained in medicine at the time of, or well, I was still in medical school 40 years ago when, when HIV was first described and, and trained in infectious diseases when there was no treatment and, and you know, patients were literally dying um, and there was not much you can do apart, to, apart from palliating them. So it's a, it's a different disease uh, in a sense. Um, and uh, of course, the treatment itself is getting better and better from, you know, patients having to take 20 pills twice a day to now literally just one pill of combined uh, treatment. And um, what's also remarkable in terms of treatment is not only does it ensure that the person can live uh, normally, live healthily and, and, and also live uh, essential normal lifespan, but if they reach an undetectable viral level, if, if they adhere to the treatment and um, uh, keep the viral levels down, we know now that they also will not transmit that infection sexually and, and mothers will not transmit that uh, the infection to their babies. So hence, um, you know, the, the, the confidence that I think we can end AIDS, or at least medically speaking. And of course, combining that with PrEP, the same pill um, uh, to people at high risk of, of becoming infected and taking these pills daily, 94% um, in large studies, you know, reduction in terms of HIV transmission. And uh, countries like Australia, where there's been um, uh, amazing rollout of both treatment and, and prevention uh, are on track to end AIDS. So, uh, 
um, in 40 years, it's taking a long time when you think about the remarkable progress in COVID-19 science and, and treatment and, you know, vaccines. Nevertheless, um, you know, um, the, the progress has been remarkable. Well, I mean, I have certainly seen these miraculous recoveries of individual patients when they start on ART Indeed. from mm. um, the long time that I spent living in sub-Saharan Africa. And I also always like to remind people that HIV and cancer have really been linked since 40 years ago when HIV Absolutely. was first discovered. And, you know, in those original case descriptions of young men in San Francisco and New York, it included Kaposi sarcoma as one of the um, constellation of features that, you know, even before HIV was discovered. And much of the early work on HIV, including the discovery of some of the first antiretrovirals, was actually done at the NCI. Um, mm -hmm. So it's great to hear you talk about this 40 years of progress. And I, I want to transition a little bit and think about as we seek to transfer some of the lessons from global progress against HIV to other disease areas like COVID, like cancer, I wonder, in your mind, what are some of the key lessons that you think we should be applying from HIV to be successful in these other areas? Yeah, I think the hallmark uh, of the HIV response, which, you know, you don't really see even to this day in, in many of the diseases, is, you know, the activism and advocacy and involvement of, of people living with HIV, the GPA principle, greater involvement of people living with AIDS, um, that then has now translated into, uh, you know, involvement of the community in terms of providing services. Um, you know, we we talk about key population-led services being successful models of delivering um, both prevention and and treatment services. So I think that's that's probably one of the. Um, unusual but good features of, of the HIV response. Of course, it came out of necessity. Um, HIV, uh, because it, it you know, was first described in already marginalized groups like gay men and, and people who inject drugs, um, was, you know, if you recall, for many years, um, didn't get the attention that, that it needed, even though there were many people dying, uh, young people dying from, from the disease way back in, in the 40s. And so out of that was born the activism, you know, um, you hear about the, Dr. Tony Fauci, um, even now talking about how AIDS activists, you know, push them to um, accelerate research um, for, for treatment. Um, etc. And, and so, um, you know, that, that, that has um, really ensured that, you know, research uh, uh, in HIV and, and also services in HIV and high level um, organizations like the Global Fund and, and UNAIDS and even us at, at the IAS ensure that there's always representation and it's not just token representation of people living with HIV in, in committees, in decision-making processes, um, uh, etc. So I think that is really something that, that I don't see uh, happening much in, in other chronic diseases. And, and it's a very important, um, important aspect of uh, ensuring that the responses you know, what we do, how, how we design trials, how we think about doing um, at trials to begin with um, are appropriate, are, are, are what um, the community needs, you know. So, so that's, that's number one. Um, number two, I think um, the ability of, uh, because of that act activism and advocacy, the ability of the HIV community to bring in um, political uh, leadership, which is so important in, in, in all health, global health response, right? Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but where, where it works and um, where there is uh, political leadership and buying is where you, you also get the financial investment and, of course, changes in, in you know, policies and the structural environment. Um, so um, what else? I think um, the, the collaboration, you know, between scientists and, and academia, of course, um, that, that happens in, in 
hopefully many other scientific disciplines. The other, um, perhaps, uh, it, you know, thinking about science, um, you know, for, for instance, our conferences, the AIDS conferences, are not just biomedical science. We engage social scientists, political scientists, um, epidemiologists, naturally. Um, so the, all the, the, the whole, um, you know, uh, gamut of, of scientific discipline from basic science to clinical, translational, public health, policy, implementation science now and, and political science are all brought together to the table at our large AIDS conferences. Um, and, and I think that's important to get the cross fertilization of ideas, um, because as you know, HIV is not just a, a, a medical disease. Yeah. So I think those three elements um, of the HIV response are, are perhaps a little bit more different than than other chronic diseases. I, I recall having colleagues going to AIDS conferences and, and say like, wow, you know, <laughs> they've never been to a medical conference like this. You know, you have activists, you have, you know, human rights marches, uh, you have, you know, of course, celebrities, et cetera, makes for a very colorful, but usually successful conference. And perhaps I should add that, yeah, you know, the, the, um, the HIV response is, is, you know, we try as much as possible to be rooted in, in human rights principles. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, it's great to hear you talk about that intersection between these various communities and stakeholders, in addition to just the scientists. This is a really nice transition to something else I wanted to ask you, which is even within the scientific work, I think so much of your own scientific portfolio and the declared priorities of um, your declared priorities as IAS pres president have really focused on the complexity of global health contexts and even as scientists the need to tackle this complexity using implementation science which you just mentioned and other methods that are really trying to address the many individual interpersonal community and social structural factors that influence health. Um, I think you started to talk about this a little bit, but I would love to hear you speak about why you think we must prioritize these multi-level approaches, which is really an extension of our traditional biomedical research paradigm. Um, so why do you think this is so essential? You know, um, HIV and now COVID-19 has really brought to the fore um, the importance of social determinants of health, you know, um, and the how how the environment where you come from, where you live in, um, so determines um, you know, you know, the, the outcome of, of your health, uh, essentially. And um, so in, in HIV, um, for instance, my own work uh, in, in amongst people who inject drugs and prisoners, you know, that multi-layer multi stigma, multi um, dimensional stigma that, that people who inject drugs um, suffer from, prevent them from accessing treatment, prevent them from accessing uh, prevention. Um, and then, of course, the, the whole criminalization that puts them into uh, incarcerated settings completely prevents them from, from accessing uh, treatment and prevention and puts them at risk of other diseases like tuberculosis, uh, like COVID-19. Um, when they're incarcerated. So, you know, as, as I got more and more involved um, in managing people living with HIV, especially if they uh, acquired the infection through uh, injecting drug use, it became very clear to me that at a public health level, um, if you don't address the, um, the underlying the root causes, um, we, we will never put an end to this. And, and it was at that time, back in the early 2000, when the number of infections in Malaysia from injecting drug use was just escalating, that you know, no, no, no amount of treatment of people who become infected is going to close the, um, the tap unless we address um, you know, the, the, the use of um, non-sterile uh, needles and syringes because we didn't have a harm reduction program at that time. So, um, so it, it really opened my eyes to, 
you know, our role as, as doctors, as clinicians, as researchers, that, you know, we, whilst we're doing good for the individual patients, um, yeah, yeah, unless we at least highlight um, the, the importance or the role that the environment they come from um, play, uh, it's, it's not going to be effective. Well, it is effective for the individual, but perhaps not for the, um, the whole community. It's great to hear you say that. We're doing a lot of, I think, serious thinking about root causes at NCI, Center for Global Health, currently. Um, you spoke about your work with particular populations that um, I think experience very severe forms of stigma often, especially in low and middle income country contexts. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what you learn from these communities or just your experiences in working with them, especially in a global context? Yeah, so the, the, the um, stigmatization or the criminalization of, of people who use drugs um, in, in our part of the world, in my part of the world, is, um, is, is quite significant. Um, you know, many countries in, in this region uh, criminalize drug use, even for small amount of drug use, um, will uh, lead to them being incarcerated. And for instance, in Malaysia, 60% of people who are in prison uh, are in for very minor non-violent drug use. And, and like I said before, it puts them at risk for other diseases, especially TB and now COVID-19. And um, because of the um, lack of um, quality healthcare in prison, they even um, lack basic, um, you know, primary healthcare, let alone, you know, access to antiretroviral therapy and, and other things. So, you know, um, I have uh, had for 10 years in an NIH sponsored uh, research in, at, at one of the large prisons in Malaysia together with my colleague, Professor Rita Altiz from Yale. And we've been trying to, well, the first um, grant was to look at uh, pre-release um, treatment with methadone uh, for, for people who, who use opioid. And, and through our work there, it became clear that TB was also a big problem in our prison. And, and so the, the current grant is on, um, on uh, seeing the feasibility of treating latent TB uh, for, for prisoners with HIV in, in prison. And through my interactions with them, I, I learned a few things. Um, number one is um, how, um, you know, poverty in particular um, puts young people at risk of, of drug use. You know, poverty, um, you know, dysfunctional families and broken homes. And, um, you know, uh, so, so that's um, the first thing that, that kind of struck me. And, um, you know, it, it, it could happen to anyone in a sense, um, you know, e even if you're not impoverished, but you, you know, you, you have a broken family. Um, that 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 puts you at risk, and by then um, you know getting involved in drug use and and um, running foul of the law, you end up in prison. Um, and particularly if you don't have good legal representation, and so people who are poor then get punished uh, again. You know, whereas rich uh, or people who can afford good lawyers may escape. Um, those many years of imprisonment. For the breadwinner, and, and often many of the men, many of those in prison are men, you know, this then means the family gets disrupted, that, that whole chain of um, the vicious cycle of poverty, drug use, imprisonment, poverty, um, neglected children, neglected families. So it just didn't make sense to me that this, this is still going on. Um, and hence, you know, my, my, my work now also transcends into looking at how we can have a more rational drug policy, both in Malaysia regionally and, and at the global level. And I think, 
there has been um, quite some movement, thankfully, in, in terms of relooking the war on drugs um, globally. Uh, because, you know, it's not, not just countries in, in my region. You know, I think the U.S. Um, has, uh, you know, incarcerates uh, probably the largest number of, of people and, with, and, and the inequities there um, is also stark. So um, from, from HIV, um, I've, I've sort of kind of expanded a little to looking at drug policies. Yeah, you've given us, I think, a lot to think about. Um, in all of these conversations, I've tried to ask people um, to, just to give them an opportunity to give us any advice uh, at the NCI Center for Global Health as we now enter our second decade. Yeah, I think um, where we started, where uh, how HIV is a little different in terms of uh, the scientific and global uh, response. I think, um, you know, in, in involving communities uh, that uh, are affected um, is, is very important in terms of, um, you know, research design, in terms of board membership, uh, because they, they, our patients really bring a, a different perspective. In the, the gone are the days where doctors know best, I think, especially now with information and knowledge being um, at you know, every individual's fingertips. Um, uh, so yeah, I think um, break away a little bit from the traditional, um, um, you, you probably are doing it already, but from the traditional sort of paternalistic medical um, uh, engagement with, with our patients and with our communities, it, it really enriches um, our programs and it certainly, you know, um, and has enriched me um, personally in terms of um, getting to know, um, you know, individuals and, and, and whole communities better rather than in that, you know, doctor patient uh, or scientist um, participant relationship. Um, they really, you know, um, um, can enrich programs and, and guide us um, to designing um, research, designing treatment that, that you know, really um, matter. That's such wonderful advice. I think we probably should end it there. So I want to thank you again, Adiva, for sharing your thoughts with us today in this global cancer conversation. And thank you for your visionary and inspirational global health leadership. We really look forward to continuing to learn and work with you in years to come. Thanks again. Thank you, Stish. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, Cancer.gov, 1-800-4-CANCER.